Dean Paul Mahoney, uh, professors, uh, students, uh, distinguished guests, um, what a feeling to be back. Um, it brings, uh, it brings uh, all such amazing memories that I'm standing here again uh, at the University of Virginia. 22 years uh, passed since I was uh, sitting on those seats uh, at the law school, getting uh, equipped, prepared by the best professors ever uh, to face life. And I tell you, I am very, very humbled today uh, to see some of my professors sitting here. Um, I never forgot what John Norton Moore and David Martin and Paul Stephen and the late Richard Lillick, God bless his soul, gave me in Charlottesville. I believe that uh, the graduates of uh, UVA uh, have become, or usually will, will be uh, outstanding practitioners and uh, they uh, usually take uh, leading positions in their governments and that they share more than uh, school ties. I think that uh, they, uh, they show a passion uh, to serve a humanity, justice, and a commitment to the rule of law. Uh, UVA paved my uh, path and crafted my career. And to UVA, I come with great honor to share with you some of my experience in diplomacy and politics. So um, I'd like to be, to say again that I'm very grateful for Dean Mahoney uh, for this opportunity and for uh, Paul Stephen for, and of course, John Bassett, uh, uh, more uh, Society for International Law for making this happen and for everyone uh, who, who really helped in, in organizing this event. Let me uh, uh, say two notes to start with. Uh, if you feel very bored and uh, I mean you'd like to have a to take a nap, I don't mind. You know this, but uh, remember the traditions of the law school that that I might ask some questions at the at the end of my speech. Um, secondly, uh, I'll try to amuse you with a confusing accent. American, British, and probably Arab, so that is just part of, of the amusement. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, the Arab world is uh, changing, and there is no point of return. Arab young men and women flocked to the streets over the past two years to show the international community that they want to have a firmer grip on their destiny and future. And that they want to break away from all traditions. My speech today at this remarkable institution comes at the right time uh, to address what is so-called the Arab Spring stretching from Morocco to Syria. I shall speak for 40, 45 minutes. And I shall divide my uh, speech into three parts. The first, I will tackle the causes that led to the explosion. And second, I will address uh, immediate results of the Arab Spring. And uh, third, I'll try to fly with you into prospects of uh, what is going to happen in the future and the positioning of stakeholders, whether regional or international, in this whole thing. So the Arab Spring as a notion and causes. The Arab nations uh, were never decolonized after the end of the colonization era in the last century. Colonization was replaced by national autocracies. And those Western authoritarian regimes, or those, those Western-backed authoritarian regimes across the Arab world um, portrayed themselves as the saviors 
of their countries and the hope for their people to have a brighter future. To the contrary, and in reality, those autocracies imprisoned the Arab society and made it suffer from socio-economic polio, rendering the uh, Arab or Arabian societies as a surplus to the international humanity. Free political movements were killed, pluralism was not thinkable of, and the nation was made to believe that the actions of their God-given leaders was meant to lead to one sacred objective, and that is the liberation of occupied Palestine. Numerous initiatives were established and launched uh, by the West and addressed to the Arab uh, Arabian societies. I will not name them, but for instance, you take the Mediterranean Dialogue of NATO. And as Professor Stephen said, you know, the uh, recent Union for the Mediterranean project that was established by the French President uh, Nicolas Sarkozy. Now, these initiatives shared a common strategic objective. First, to achieve political and security dialogue. Second, to achieve economic partnership. And third, to achieve social and human cooperation. Of course, I'm saying between the North and the South. South and South. Unfortunately, all these initiatives failed to achieve any concrete results. And in particular, the following observations can be um, underlined. There has been a clear failure in achieving peace and security in the greater Middle East area. The security issue deteriorated, not just you know, in the Arabian area, but also reaching Iran and Afghanistan. There has been a failure in segregating Islam from terrorism. And there has also, uh, and actually, uh, possibly we fail to keep terrorism at bay and confined to one country, Afghanistan. And I'll come back to this later. It's because it's spreading now. And also they failed to stop the continuous Israeli attacks on Lebanon and Gaza. The initiatives second remark is that also uh, they shame i mean there has been a shameful failure in achieving any south south cooperation and integration in the region for instance the eu arab free trade area which was supposed to be active in 2010 uh, is not there and Yet, and I think that we are way, you know, th this deadline is way behind us and it seems that there is no breakthrough to achieve anything on that front. There are many economic, multilateral and regional frameworks that did not work. For instance, also the summits of the Arab leaders, economic summits in particular, rather than to address economic issues, opportunities, bilateral investments and have concrete results in terms of energy, uh, uh, information technology and transport, usually they turned into uh, um, an opportunity for the leaders to have family photos and not addressing any uh, concrete uh, results that was supposed to reflect on the livelihood of the citizens in the, in the Arab world, thereby um, enhancing the issue of poverty and aggravating unemployment. And today, we are talking about worrying skyrocketing uh, uh, ratios of about over 25% of unemployed people in a community that is about 70% of which is under the age of 40. So basically, when you have young people, you either have a, an opportunity at your hand 
or a bomb. It depends on, on your economic and social policies in a certain area. Thirdly, there has been a complete failure in the so-called Middle East peace process. I mean, if we want to put aside the cold peace that is taking place between Jordan and Egypt on the one side and Israel on the other, tens of tedious rounds of talks delivered nothing. And actually, it came, or it became as, as an objective itself to have these talks, while overlooking the end game, which is peace itself. And I will come to this because this is a very important point when you look at the slogans that were raised by demonstrators in the streets. I'll come to this point. Number four, the final remark, is that uh, all these initiatives that were given by the West to the Arab world, um, and this will take me to directly talk about the Arab Spring, they all failed to have any proper democracy in any of the Arab countries. No pluralism and no freedom. Unfortunately, this happened under the watchful eyes of the West. And all these initiatives, actually, were foreseen uh, in the context of the Western interest, rather than to dig deeper into the aspiration of the people and what they want. All the above factors led to the explosion. Nations will decide at a certain point or juncture to turn the page. And I am speaking in the nation that made history. The spark, as you all know, came from the small Tunisian city of uh, Sidi Bouzaid some two years ago. Two years ago. And under the so-called the Arab Spring, and possibly the UK independent newspaper was the first to call it the Arab Spring. And maybe in doing so, they were reflecting on the uh, European revolts that took place. Uh, uh, and here's one of my professors also coming in, and I'm very, very grateful to see him. Uh, Hello, how are you, Professor Martin? Um, and I think that they were referring to um, the European revolts that took place in 1848 under the name the Spring of Nations. I am not sure about the terminology or the name of the Arab Spring. And mark this here at the University of Virginia. I'd like to give it another name. Maybe it will become a, a, a trademark or a patent from this, from this podium. I believe that or I'd like to call it the Arab Political Awakening, APA. Why? Because the spring is seasonal, but what we're seeing is evolving, and it's not ending. Secondly, revolutions really need to be aligned and to have leadership. What we've seen is people flocking to the streets without any leadership for the first time in history. And this is why, really, I have difficulty in calling this an Arab Spring and Revolution. I think that this is, this is, this is a moment for the Arab political awakening in a general chapeau or context. And again, people went to the streets because of their poor situation, economic uh, poor dynamism, the hijacking of their natural and uh, resources by their leaders or um, a certain group of political elites, um, the fact that they had rigged elections all over the Arab world, and of course the fact that also Arab societies now are suffering from social and cultural and religious polarization, um, which is uh, uh, really uh, defining or clustering the Arab societies into poor and rich, into educated and illiterate, into uh, uh, seculars and radical Muslims, into Muslims and Christians, and also within the Muslims into Sunnis and Shiites. Now, all these issues, in my perspective, 
led to the explosion. This takes me now to, to, to the second part of my uh, uh, speech. What immediate outcomes did the Arab political awakening have so far? Now, with the outbreak of demonstrations on the streets of Arab cities such as Amman and Cairo and Tripoli and you name it, um, there has been some deep political changes in certain countries like Egypt and Tunisia and Libya and Yemen, but to a variable and lesser extent in countries like Jordan, um, Bahrain, Kuwait and Morocco, and to an ongoing geopolitical battle that is taking place in Syria. Now one can identify the following six immediate results of the APA. The first is that while the West, led by the United States of America, led two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan to introduce democracy, Arab people proved to the international community that they can oust their leaders who lost popularity. And they don't really need international intervention. Except, of course, in the situation of Libya, but that has its own causes. Demonstrations brought down the scarecrow that has often been used by Arab leaders that the people, the masses, are politically and socially immature. And the masses proved that their fundamental principles and values are the same as those of yours in the West. Human dignity, center point for all of this. Number two, there has also, um, the West has, has wrongfully accepted the Arab leaders or autocracies, if I may say it more correctly, as prima facie unchangeable realities. And that it was under the misconception that Arabs will be better off if governed by the so-called iron glove. This er erroneous perception was always nurtured by Arab regimes who always advocated with Washington and with European capitals that if it was not them in office, it would be radical Muslims in office. And this will be detrimental to the interests of the West. And I believe that also this perception in Washington was perceived or was also nurtured by Washington and, and, the, and the European perspective about Islamophobia, um, which eventually will, will affect how the US and the EU determine their policies in the Middle East. And today, you can witness this by the swinging that is happening between supporting the popular aspirations, democratic aspirations of the people, or lining up with what I call the conservative counterattacks that are taking place from powers of the past. The third eminent or immediate result is that also demonstrations brought down the scarecrow of Islamists and that, that these are harmful. And here, mind you, I am talking about moderate Islam. I'm not talking about the so-called jihadis, okay? Now, this has been brought down. And I think that this line of moderate Islam has shown some great political dynamism in dealing with the international community. Look at, for instance, the Freedom uh, and Justice Party of Egypt, the, the party for the Muslim Brotherhood Front, and the leader or the new president, Mohamed Morsi. 
I think that they have been able to deal with international requisites and also they have taken into account the regional requisites, for instance, the uh, results of the uh, Camp David uh, Accord with Israel. So it shows that also this, this stigma that those are, they should not be there is, has been brought down. However, I would like to stress also that the U.S. should not consider that the moderate Islam project as the only democratic project in the region. And I shall come back to this again later in my third part uh, of the speech. Number four, for the generation of Facebook, and I'm sure that all of you are, uh, you know how to utilize Facebook more than I do. For the generation of Facebook, Islam proved to be not a dogma, nor is it a religious ideology. It is rather a lifestyle. And this is why the golden era of Islamic jurisprudence is over now. And now we are facing the so-called or the rising political Islam. And this is very important to understand, you know, try to separate Islam, the youth, and a lifestyle. Number five. In the past decade, we had two axes. One is called moderation. I'm talking, of course, about Arab countries. One is called the moderation group or camp or axis, and the other is the opposition. The demonstrations in the streets in the Arab cities brought down these two axes. With the toppling of the former president of Egypt, Hosni Mubarak, who was the leader of the moderation group, protests and the slogans in Cairo, Amman, Manama, and all, all the other cities it proved that the people are not very pro that camp which is usually aligned with Western policies. At the other end also, with the toppling of Muammar al-Qaddafi in Libya and the ongoing revolution in, in Syria against a brutal regime, also the people brought down the policy of such regimes to extract legitimacy for their office from opposing any breakthrough in the region and by trying always to play against the Palestinian cause and the liberation of Palestine in order to stay in office. So basically the Arab people today are telling both camps we are fed up. Fed up to be very much aligned with Western policies and also fed up to just refuse for the sake of rejection. But I have also to say that the departure from this axis is witnessed today by the creation of another clustering or grouping that I will come to later. Number six, or the six immediate uh, result, is that the Arab awakening uh, project stripped the, mid the Middle East uh, peace process. It just, it, 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 it clarified it. People said that it is no more, as the leaders are saying, the cornerstone of our lives and the gateway for solving all our problems in the region is the Middle East peace process and the establishment of a Palestinian state. Things are much deeper than that. So basically, and, and, and this was always, you know, advocated by the moderation axis, that, you know, you will hear, you know, the rhetoric. We have to solve the Palestinian issue because the Palestinian issue is the cornerstone of all our problems. And once we do that, you will see that the West is happier and everybody is happier. People said, was saying, actually, and this is why I want to link to what I was saying at the, at the beginning, said in their slogans, this is not our problem. Our problem is about our economic prosperity about our dignity, about our freedom, about the ability of having a choice in choosing our leaders, ministers and parliamentarians, and of course, in making a lifestyle or in making actually a choice in what we want to be. 
This is the real problem of the Arab world and the Arab people. So basically, this concludes some six immediate results that burst out of the Arab Awakening, Awakening uh, project. And this takes me now to exploring with you some prospects for the future. I hope that I'm not boring you down with, with, with all of this. Now let's, I'll, I'll tell you what, what I'll do for, for the prospects. I will give you some general perspectives, but then we will talk about meaningful deliverables, political Islam and pluralism, regional chaos, and regional political settlement in, in the Middle East, and international and regional polarization. To start with, as a collective general prospect, the overarching principle and the only way forward for the Arab world in order to have meaningful political reform would be by ending all autocratic regimes in our countries. Those regimes where you find that the power is vested in the head of the state. And we should replace that by vesting the power in the people, of course, in a democratic way. Now, this also requires, and this is an important boy, b point, by the way. I, I, I made it the other time. I was having lunch with the foreign minister of uh, the UK, William Hague, and I said that we need also, under this overarching principle, to move from what has been created by the Arab leaders, the so-called rentier state. What is a rentier state? He asked me, uh, Ahmed, what is a rentier state? A rentier state is a state where it does not have citizens. It creates subjects. And it relates the relationship between the state and the subjects on the basis of opportunity, not on the basis of solid passion and, and commitment to the nation. We need to move from the concept of a rentier state in our countries and go into what you have, proper civil states. And the proper civil states, you have the concept of citizenship at the cornerstone of it. I mean, I, I believe, you know, and I am advocating this all the time in Jordan because, you know, Jordan has two parties, you know, Jordanians, East Bankers, and uh, Jordanians of, of Palestinian origins. And I always, you know, take the model of the U.S. in this context by saying, the moment that you become American, you are American. So basically, you have at heart the concept of citizenship. Now, also in order not to be surprised, I believe that the international community needs to look at us with an eye, especially the US here I'm referring, with, a, with an eye that is, that is analytical, but not only taking into account the US or the Western methodologies, but rather trying to dig deeper in order to understand the exclusivities and nature of the Arabian society. That has always been probably a problem. And this is why, for instance, in the Union for the Mediterranean, I was fighting hard, telling the Europeans, we want to create two mirrors, the Europeans and the Arabs. We don't want, you know, the West to become the East or the East to become the West. But at least we need to create mirrors whereby when we both stand facing each other, we see the same values, but while at the same time keeping the same backgrounds and, and the same belongings. And this is why I believe it has always been a mistake to view our region with a USI as opposed to regional uh, uh, background or referencing. Now today, and I was speaking to Professor John Norton Moore about this, 
uh, to, before we go in. Today, what is happening in the Arab world, we are moving from autocracy to democracy. And in doing that, we have to pass through what is called an anocracy. Now, what is an anocracy? It is, it is a state of play in between the two states, but this is very dangerous and critical to two issues, meaningful freedoms and human rights. So basically, they will portray the structure that we are moving into a democracy, but when you dig deeper in the substance, you find lots of problems. Take, for example, what is happening in Iraq. We have the prime minister who is elected today, Mr. Al-Maliki, but when you look at the record of human rights and what is happening in that country, you see how bad it is. You have sectarian uh, clustering, and actually you run the risk probably of dividing Iraq. And when you talk about freedoms in Egypt, or in Jordan, for instance, you see that the old good habits come back and you have arrests here and there for trying to uh, pose an opinion in a free and democratic way. But then I would like to say, who said that the road for pluralism and democracy is a rosy one? I, 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 mean, I mean, revolutions have always been very difficult and they take a long path and they will suffer from major setups and sometimes you have to make detours. But I think that what is needed now is that the international community has to come to terms on creating a civilized context on the basis of which that it can prove to be a foundation to accommodate the Arab democratic project that is coming. So now what we need to do as an international community is trying to find this civilized context. Now when I want to take the first prospects, the meaningful deliverables. The Arab people are fed up today with their leaders to keep giving them words without any meaningful actual deliverables. A case on point in this context are those countries, countries which manage to avoid violence and approach reform uh, on a gradual basis. And I'm saying avoid violence so far. A case on point, a model, is Jordan. Now, the official line in my country has been that we are moving with reform and that there has been some certain milestones, such as constitutional amendments, and we have made elections, parliamentary elections, just, you know, two weeks ago. In my mind, the importance is not just to have these milestones. In my mind, we have to dig into the quality of these milestones. And what is the substance? Not just, you know, their simple occurrence. In Jordan, when they did the parliamentary elections, they did it in a very negative, conducive environment with the boycotting of major powers, such as, for instance, the Islamic Brotherhood Front, and with a very retarded, uh, uh, inward-looking uh, law that is non-exclusive, and obviously the result was very clear from the outset. We have a parliament today, which is not different by any means to the parliament that we had before. Usually you will have MPs with a tribal background, conservatives, and those are usually aligned with the state's policy. So how are you talking about political reform in Jordan when you are remaking the same scene again? And I say this all the time in Jordan. Now, I think that this situation is conducive to augmenting the political stagnation in countries like Jordan. And I hope that we don't witness serious problems by the end of this year. 
And ultimately, I believe not even a political amateur can be convinced that in such a situation you can have parliamentary governments as the ones that you have in the US or in the UK. The other second prospect is political Islam and pluralism. And this is important, I think, that all of you is asking what is going on in Egypt. I think we need to ask the question, what is it exactly that the Islamists want in the Arab world? Are they up to having real pluralism and democracy? Or are we heading to having a new authoritarian regime, like the ones that we used to have, except that this one extracts its power from divine rule? You know, the others, the before they used to have their powers from the White House. The unfortunate reality is that some of those Islamic groups really believe that their power comes from heaven. And as such, it's very complicated to deal with them. The issue, where, to, where do you draw the line? For instance, take the case of Egypt. In the front line today, we have the Islamic Brotherhood Front. Fine, a political party. Still, we're not really sure about what is Morsi is all about. But behind them, you have the Salafis. Salafis is, I'm not sure if you are aware of is is more of a very restrictive uh, political Islamic group, but they are willing to deal with the others, but their reference is always in the sky, in the heaven, divine rules. And behind the Salafis, you have the Jihadis, which have always been listed uh, in the US as terrorist groups. Those are restricted, they don't want to deal with anyone, and they don't believe in any other, you know, uh, political references. Now, the Jihadis take us back to Al-Qaeda, which is stalking all of us. This is a scene in Egypt. Where do you draw the line? Do, if, is the frontliners are really willing to have proper pluralism, whereby they will accept the issue or the notion of political Islam and accept themselves as one factor among other factors, like the liberals or the socialist, social democrats and so forth. I think that there are also incidents that are taking place in Egypt and in other, other countries that really makes us worried. For instance, last week, uh, a very leading clergyman uh, legitimized the uh, uh, killing uh, or the future killing of two prominent leftist leaders. One of them is Muhammad al-Baradi. I'm sure that you, you, know, you know all of, uh, you, know, you know him, and Anhamdin Sabah. In Tunisia, for instance, we witnessed last week the assassination of a leading opposition uh, uh, person uh, who is a leftist uh, in the front, uh, in, the, in the popular front. This is a leftist uh, and liberal group opposing Al-Nahda party, the Islamic party in, uh, in power. Does, does that remind you of anything uh, to do with Afghanistan, for instance? You know, the, the episodes of, of killings and assassinations just to, to carry out uh, political liquidation. That's very worrying if we go down that road. I believe that the US will be committing a mistake if it solely puts or places its bet on the Islamic project in the region. And I believe that the US and the EU should not summarize countries like Jordan, Egypt, or Tunisia, and others with the two fact, f f with the two parties that they have there, the right-wing uh, military-oriented, if I may say, players, the state and its apparatus, and on the other end, the Islamic opposition. I believe 
that there are other powers, progressive, social, democratic, is in the making. And they are making their democratic and political project slowly, but surely. I like to refer to those, of course, those are neither right-wing oriented, and I, when I say here right-wing, not in the sense that you have in the States. I'm saying in the sense of autoc autocracy. They are neither right-wing nor Islamic oriented. They believe in freedom and in social values. And I like to call them th the third way. And I believe that the US should be very careful in looking at such projects in the region. I am, I am honored to be, as Professor Stevens just said, I am honored to be a founding member of one of these uh, social democrat projects under the so-called, we call it the Free Assembly Party in Jordan. Let me go to another prospect, that is the regional chaos. Regional chaos in the region, okay. This is another pressing matter. I believe that it will be very risky if we end up having orchestrated chaos and there will be serious implications not just for the region, but also for the global security. Particularly, I believe that the gateway for regional chaos is through Syria, and especially any plans to divide that country. I mean, let me, let me be clear. In my mind, I see no future for the regime of Bashar al-Assad, at least from a legal, human rights, and diplomatic perspective, but also we will be committing a sin if we plunge into the swamp of dividing that country. Obviously, it's clear that neither Bashar al-Assad can suppress the opposition, but also the opposition cannot take him out. So basically, there's no way for a, a military uh, um, um, uh, solution we need to go directly into a political solution as soon as possible. But then also, a political solution will raise this very important question. What will happen with the thousands of radicals who are fighting in that country, especially those with Islamic background? And you know, or maybe you heard of the so-called Jabhat al-Nusra or, or al-Nusra Front which is again another radical group that is fighting and the United States of America placed it on the terrorist list. What will happen with all of those if we start going into a political dimension and settlement? I mean, where would they go? Now, also, there are double standards in the, in the international uh, community's activities. Like, for instance, they are, the U.S. is considering those people as terrorists, but then you see uh, a very strong ally to Washington fighting a war in Mali, trying to reach out after fellow groups related or relevant or have some reference with Jabhat al-Nusra. So, and, and so far the EU did not actually take the same approach as the US in this context. For instance, look what is happening in Sana'i today. Jihadis are creating an area reminding us of Tora Bora in Afghanistan. And it seems to be that in the future, it's not going to be only the states as the real players or the only players. It seems that we are opening the door for non-state players to dictate and call the shots. Today, jihadis in Sana'i, or Sina, as we call it in Arabic, are blowing the gas pipeline in Egypt, they are uh, into the business of drugs and narcotics and the plantation of that. And it reminds me exactly of what was happening in Afghanistan. And I think in this context, not just the regional players will pay a price like Jordan, but also other neighboring countries. Look at the reports coming from Germany last week, cautioning that if German nationals who are jihadis fighting in Syria or getting their training in Egypt come home, that will be a serious challenge for Germany. 
This takes me to another prospect, which is the regional political settlement. I believe that the Syrian gateway should not only be looked at as a national settlement. I think that it could incorporate some very complicated issues in the region, such as the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, such as other questions as to whether we will have Qatari gas, gas passing through, through uh, um, Syria, or having borders for Syria on the Tiberius Lake, or for instance, what will happen to the, to the Turkish political Islam model after its dwindling chances to get into the EU. Those are major questions that we have to, look, to, to take into consideration when we look at the settlement in the region. But I was, would like also to say that in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, any talks, and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the issue of co-federation between Jordan and any structures of Palestine. Any talks about co-federation between Jordan and the Palestinian Authority is not going to be helpful and it's not going to bring lasting peace for Israel. Why? Because it's going to defer the problem. It's going to abort the Palestinian case very immaturely and it's going to hit at heart the Jordanian democratic project. And this is why I believe that at this time, the regional settlement may be, until you know the dust of the APA come down, maybe we should tackle this issue on a temporary basis until we have a new peace initiative. And by the way, I should say that the peace initiative that has always been advocated or put on the table by the Arabs is dead. It is only waiting for a death certificate from the White House. Last prospect is the international and regional polarization. And I did ask this question to uh, Professor Stephen today. I mean, I, it seems to me also that from all of what is happening, that this single polar system is dwindling. I mean, it's closing. And it seems that a multipolar system is in the making, especially with the role of China and Russia, and take the position of the Russians in Syria. Now, also it seems that such polarization is breeding on the regional level by way of clustering the region into Sunnis and Shiites. And this is very critical, by the way. I am afraid that if we go down that road in the Middle East, this will mean you will see the mushrooming of ethnic states. And this will not be only critical to the region, but it will affect the global security. Because here, again, you are playing states in the hands of religious groups. And I do not believe that Israel will be safe from that epidemic. I mean, it, it is obvious that you know, things are, are not very clear in terms of, of the future. And I mean, I remind you, if we're going to start dealing with, with non-states, the US led a war in Afghanistan for 14 years dealing with non-state players. And in 2014, the NATO and ISAF are going to be out of Afghanistan. But I think that they are leaving behind them lots of uncertainties. What has been achieved and what lies ahead? In conclusion, I should say that in our part of the world, we anticipate a vibrant and catalytic role for the US. Your interest is not just about securing a single state, but radiating your principles of freedom, dignity, and nation building. Now, while the economic assistance is very important, but also I believe that we need now to uphold issues of human rights, women rights, children rights, nation building, and of course, overall, qualitative, quality-oriented political reform in the region. In my mind now, I think it's high time that the US starts considering a Marshall Fund for the APA. And this fund will act as a tool directed at those countries which are transiting into proper democracies 
And the benchmarks for such a fund will be firm and will be uh, addressed against uh, critical and serious political reforms in the region. I will end on this note that in his reinstatement speech, President Obama stressed the US, the US commitment to the Arab peoples seeking freedom and democracy. This commitment is highly appreciated. Arab young men and women are optimistic about Obama's commitment and that it will not be mere lip service this time. And that contrary to his very famous speech in Cairo some four years ago, this time those young men and women in my region will not be disappointed. Thank you very much.